Okay, there they go. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11 this morning. If you do not have a Bible with you, or if you observe that someone else does not have a Bible with them this morning, would you be so kind as to help with that and make sure to get them a copy of the Scripture? The reason for that is because we recognize, first of all, that the Bible is God's Word. How does God speak to us today? Does God speak to us today through prophets? Does God speak to us today through supernatural knowledge? No, God speaks to us today by His supernatural Word, this book. And we believe that it's a book that has no error in it, and that if you are to know God, you'll know Him because of what His Word says. That is, this is God telling us who He is. And I don't know about you, but men have disappointed me enough in life through not telling me things the way that they actually were, or thinking that things were a certain way and finding out that they didn't know what they were talking about, that I need to know who God is, not from what a man says about God, but I need to know who God is from what He says about Himself. That's important, isn't it? It's vital. And so that's why we emphasize the Word of God, the teaching of the Word of God. I haven't mentioned this in, in uh, quite a while, but it is also vitally important for us as believers to recognize and to make sure that we know why we use the Bible we use. You may notice in our church that it seems that we use kind of an older version of the Scripture. We use the King James Version of the Bible. There's a reason for that. It's not because we enjoy these and thous in a loftier language, although a superior language is one that I think would reflect well uh, the, the Word of God. In other words, our language in, in our country is diminishing. It's losing a lot of grammatical clarity. We're losing uh, because of because of the poor education uh, system that we have in our country right now. We're losing a lot of vocabulary. But just because uh, we're losing our vocabulary, I don't want the Bible to come down to my level. In other words, I want it to be practical. I want to understand it. But if I don't know a word, I want to learn learn what the Word means instead of changing the Word to something that God didn't say. And this is the version of the Scripture that is translated not uh, by phrase or by thought or interpretation. It's, it's translated word from word, and it's translated from the text of the Scriptures that believers have always known that were perfect and that reflected uh, the untampered, uncontaminated word of, the God, word of God. Now, I don't want to get into it this morning, into the discussion about it, but other versions use corrupt, uh, corrupt uh, text for their origin language. And so that's why we use the King James Bible in our church. Just in summary, now I can give you facts beyond the uh, general statements. We could, we could have those discussions, but it's important that you have a copy of the Scripture because you need to know that God said it. And uh, not that not that this is Pastor Price's opinion. It, it, it uh, makes me feel good if you value my opinion. But the truth is, is that I could be wrong. And uh, oftentimes am. But God never is. So if we preach the Word of God, we'll get it right. And it'll be yours when you leave here today because you'll know God said it for yourself. Did you find Matthew chapter 11? Okay, if you found Matthew chapter 11, then I would like to go down to verse 20. And we're going, to read to the, we're going to read 10 verses this morning. And this is Jesus upbraiding. Upbraiding means uh, scolding, if you will, or uh, giving uh, criticism toward. Okay, so verse 20. Then he began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago and sat cloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. And at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, uh, o, o Father, 
the Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, Father, I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word this morning with God the convincing of your Holy Spirit. Help us not to overemphasize that which your word does not. Help us not to de-emphasize anything that we would need to be emphasized this morning. Help us with clarity. Now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to do something just a little different this morning because we won't have time at the end of the message for it. And I want to focus on the last couple of verses that we found in our text here this morning. And those are the verses, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take you yoke, my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Well, they, that's a song, actually. How many of you know the, the hymn? Come unto me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let's see. Leave cut with... I can't remember... Um, Come and we will be blessed. Anyway, I I just butchered it. But it's a song from that. And I remember uh, from this passage of Scripture, I remember being a kid and singing this song, Come Unto Me, playing it on the piano and so forth. And so it's a familiar passage of Scripture. I think I've memorized it. I, I know I've memorized it because I've memorized this chapter before. And uh, it's a familiar passage of Scripture. But what does it mean? You know, sometimes we know words, we, we sing. So you, ever, you ever sing a song as a kid, and then you realize when you get older that either the words were different than you thought they were, or <laughs> I think you remember the words that you sang as a kid, and you get older, you're like, oh, that wasn't the word, and then the concept wasn't that at all. Uh, my wife was a school teacher for quite a number of years, and so she used to come home and tell me some of the words that the kids would sing in the songs, you know, and it's always kind of funny. Uh, one of the kids in our in our uh, children's church, Melissa and I were taking uh, that child home a couple of months ago, actually around Christmas time, and that person, that child was telling us how they already knew the songs for Christmas and didn't know why we were practicing them so much. So Mrs. Price asked, well, would you sing them for me? And she sang um, Silent Night. And I won't tell you the words that she substituted because they were a little off color, actually, but <laughs> Silent Midnight, Holy Midnight, and then sleep in heavenly, and she used a different word, and so forth. And I don't know what in the world the images were conjured in her head, but uh, <laughs> the funny thing about it was that, uh, you know, sometimes we get words wrong. A lot of times the reason we get words wrong is because we don't understand the concept behind it. When we understand the concept, then the words make more sense. Um, this is a passage of Scripture, though, I think that we kind of know the words. Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. And uh, my, Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And he, he summarized all these things up. And the question is, first of all, what's he talking about? What's he talking about? We're in a, con we're in a context where Jesus has just pronounced terrible, tragic, judgment for cities which have rejected him in spite of the fact that he did more miracles and more marvelous works in their presence. And then he compares them with wicked cities that had previously actually been destroyed because of their wickedness, Tyre and Sidon, and then Sodom. Now most of us know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, don't we? When in the Old Testament, Abraham's nephew Lot had pitched his tent towards Sodom, and he's actually living in this city. And it has become so wicked, and Lot is there that God said, you know what, that city is so wicked, it can't, it can't exist anymore. That's pretty bad when you think about this world and what God tolerates, isn't it? And God said, that city is so terrible, it's so wicked, 
that I'm going to destroy it. And he ended up destroying it in spite of the fact that Abraham had pled and implored God for mercy. He said, God, if there's, what was it, a, a thousand and then a hundred or fifty righteous men, will you spare the city? And God said, yes. God, if there's ten, there weren't ten righteous men in the city. There was only a lot. And God said, that one guy needs to leave. And that's how wicked Sodom was. And yet God said that the cities that had had Jesus do miracles in them, because of their unwillingness to repent and receive Him as their Savior, their unwillingness to know Him as their God, that it would be more tolerable in the judgment for Sodom than for those cities that are in Jerusalem, which uh, subsequently were named as, or I'm sorry, had a heritage of being God's people, named among God's people. So then Jesus concludes by saying, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my, I, I am meek and lowly. And my, what do you say? I, I keep I'm misquoting you. Shall, oh, in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. What's it mean? Well, you know what a yoke is, right? A yoke is. The one we usually picture is usually a piece of wood that's, that has a shape in it to rest over the necks of oxen. And it is used as a way to, to uh, rest on the shoulders of oxen so that they can carry uh, a weight. And it yokes them together, hooks them together, and uses it so they can pull a load. I haven't seen many of these in person, but in some countries you'll see people that have carrying handles that go over their shoulders and then they hang buckets on them to carry on either side of them. And so it, the yoke uh, harness, it hooks up to them and they use it to carry a burden. And so a yoke is an implement that is harnessed to, in this context, an individual in order to carry a burden. So a yoke is heavy. And Jesus is looking at these individuals who are lost and who are facing eternal damnation. And He says to them, instead of your eternal consequences, come to Me. I'll give you rest. Take My yoke upon you. Learn of Me. And so He said, give Me yours. Take, come to Me. I'll give you rest. And then take the yoke that I give you. Well, what yoke or what burden does Jesus give us to bear? You ever ask that question? It's a pretty practical question, but it's easy to sing the song and not think about it. What's the burden? Well, if you simply look at what Jesus requires of a believer, that's the burden. Before I was saved, I was burdened by sin. That was my burden. And every sin I ever committed was added to the load. It's the way a lost person is. When you sin, that's a weight that's placed on you and it can't be removed. You are facing judgment because of your sin. The next time you sin, it's added to the burden. And every sin makes the burden heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And you are literally under the load of everything you've ever done and you can try to try to do things to get the burden removed, but they don't work. You can try and do good works, but good works have nothing to do with debt. Doing good doesn't make the evil go away. And so the burden just continues. You can try righteousness. You can try to be good. But the Bible says that without Jesus Christ, our righteousness is like filthy rags. It just makes it worse. And literally until an individual comes to Jesus and receives Him as his Savior, everything that is a weight is added to Him. The waste of His years, the sin of His life, the burdens of the world, the desires and the things that cannot be fulfilled, everything is a weight. And you're so overloaded that you're crushed by the load. And Jesus said, come to me, I'll give you rest. And He takes our burden off of us handily and places it on His own shoulders. Takes our sin and our weight. And Jesus took our judgment for our sin by being crucified on the cross. Now this is just a summary, but it's an incredible thing. 
for Jesus to take our sin and have it placed on Him and then go to the cross and die for our sin. That's what the burden is that we had. The question is, after we come to Jesus, Jesus said, then I'll give you a burden to replace yours. The difference being that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I don't know how many of you are into outdoors, into backpacking and that sort of thing, but it's really interesting to see uh, what some people can do as far as backpacking as, and uh, as far as what they can carry in a backpack. Now, you can tell an experienced outdoorsman and an inexperienced outdoorsman by the weight of their packs. You can just tell. I mean, you grab a guy's pack and you're like, he doesn't have anything in there. You know, this guy's been camping a lot. He's been, he knows what he needs. He knows what he doesn't need. And he has, a, he has lightened everything that is in the pack. And he only has the bare necessities. You'd be amazed at what he has, actually. How he can do anything he needs to do uh, but he doesn't have anything extra at all. Because there's no use on going on a long trip through difficult terrain and carrying more than you have to carry. And the fact is, is that you and I are on a trip, aren't we? We are on the journey through life. And we're, we're going through life, and it's Christ's desire that we be unburdened. I don't mind carrying a light pack. I don't want to carry a heavy one. And so that's the, that's the picture, that's the analogy that Jesus is using. And He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What's Jesus' burden? Well, live a perfect life. Would that be a tough one? Yes. That's not it, is it? No, Jesus said, give me your sin, I'll give you my righteousness. Is righteousness a burden? No. What's the burden? What's the burden we are to bear? Well, yeah. It's exactly that. Jesus, if you look at the things that Jesus commands or tells us to do, there are a couple things He tells us to do. One, He tells us to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. Okay? So your burden is to love God. Well, the Bible says that isn't so complicated because we love Him because He first loved us. It's not so difficult to love someone who loves you. Is it? So that's one of the burdens. What else? Well, souls of men. The Bible says that when you look at commands of the Scripture, we're to love God, we're to love our brethren, and the Bible says we're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature and to teach them and to baptize them in the name of Jesus. So share Jesus with others. And you know if you'll search the Scripture and you'll look at all the commands that Jesus gives, that's the burden. Our burden is to preach the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ to the lost. In other words, to tell people good news. Now, isn't that incredible? I'm amazed at how the world tries to misconstrue the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are two words that kids are constantly programmed with all the time by their teachers, their socialist teachers, their anti-God teachers. Two words, positivity and negativity. Positivity and negativity. And anything about God is, is lumped into the negativity category. You try to tell someone about the love of Jesus and they'll say, well, you're just being negative. Well, how is it negative to tell you that you can be unburdened? It's because you're talking about my sin. You call me a sinner and that's negative. No, I'm telling you that there's hope in Jesus Christ and that although you can do nothing for yourself and though it's impossible for you to have eternal life, I am telling you that Jesus paid it all and it's free. Eternal life is free and you can be set free. That's negativity. No, my friend, that's positivity. It's amazing how the world tries to twist things, to change the message. You know, it's so negative that you say that Jesus is the only way. My friend, it's negative to try any other way because it won't work. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by Him. You may have tried religion... You may have tried even Christianity all your life, but until you try going to the cross of Jesus Christ and receiving Him as your Savior as a free gift, you do not know freedom. You just know burden. And Jesus paid it all. Paid the price of our sin. He made, the, the, he made salvation a gift that is offered freely to everyone. There's nothing negative about that. You got to be careful about how you frame things and allow allow the gospel be, to be framed. 
But I like to get negative for just a little bit, if you don't mind, if you'll permit me this morning for the fun of it. And it's because our text talks about some things that help us to understand positive things, but they're in a negative light. The thing I want to talk about today from our context today is hell. Hell. You know, I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure that hell is preached about enough. Uh, I think in some, in some circles, I think it becomes the entire focus, and I think it becomes imbalanced. But the word hell, or references to hell, are uh, mentioned 54 times in the Scripture, and that's quite a bit. In other words, if you were to read through the Bible, you'd find early in the Old Testament references to hell, and you'll find all through the New Testament references to hell, and so the Bible talks about hell. And so I think it would behoove us, because Matthew mentions it at least three times, in at least three contexts, talks about hell. I think it'd be good for us to look at hell today. And I will tell you right up front that there's nothing positive about hell except that you don't have to go there. It's the only good news about hell, and I'll tell you that right up front. But I'm bothered just a little bit by, as believers, our trying to take anything negative out of the preaching of the gospel message, and because of that we remove the incentive, the incentive or the reason that we need Jesus. In other words, lost people always say, don't talk to me about hell, that's negative. Don't say hell, that's negative. And so we don't tell people about it. Don't talk about judgment. That's negative. And so we don't want to talk about judgment. Well, my friend, then we have a message that's absolutely meaningless. You have no problems. Everything is, is as Shamir likes to say, hunky-dory. Life is wonderful. Things are going great. And uh, there's, there's nothing wrong, so trust Jesus as your Savior. Why? If everything's fine, why? Why change? Why receive Christ as my Savior if everything in life is A-OK? -okay? My friend, there's nothing wrong with reality, is there? Now, you try to tell somebody that everything's okay. You, you, uh, you'll find after a while that message may cheer people up, but after a while it, it kind of returns empty. So you may have come to the church house this morning and say, you know what, I need a positive message. I need some positivity. Good, we'll get some. <laughs> we'll get there. But you know what? You might need some reality. Because what's going on in, in your life and what's going on in every person's life, realistically speaking, isn't all good. There are individuals who pride themselves and never counseling anything, never mentioning or saying anything negative. Matter of fact, I had a guy, a psychiatrist, that called me a year ago, and he, he interviewed me before he recommended our church to somebody that he was, that he was uh, counseling with. And the individual that he's counseling with, he said, he said, I just want to call him and talk to you about your preaching and your services. And I said, well, what would you like to talk about? He said, well, I just want to make sure that, uh, it's, that it's an uplifting service. And I said, well, I think so. I didn't tell him how handsome I was or anything like that. But I said, you know, I think it's uplifting. You know, I think our preaching is uplifting. I think our singing is uplifting. He said, well, what I'm talking about specifically, he said, is that it would be really a bad thing if, you know, he's trying to better himself and to think positive in life and you were to talk about anything negative, like sin or like hell or like problems in life. He said he just needs encouragement. The, he still sent the guy to our church. It's interesting. I think he couldn't find... I don't know. I don't know why. He, anyway, so I told the guy to come to our church. And he guess what? You know, when I preach, I, I don't consider myself to be a negative person. Do you? I'm pretty positive. I have eternal life and I believe that God is saving souls. He's changing lives and that there's hope for every person who's on this planet. There's hope and I think that's an uplifting message, to be quite frank with you. But friend, I want to remind you as well that sin is real and hell is real, and they're both a problem. Sin is a problem and hell is a place you don't want to go. It has been popular in theological circles for men to try to take the words that hell is translated from and to say that hell is more a reference of a low place or a burning place, but it's not an eternal place of torment. And uh, friend, I just want to tell you, you can 
do Greek word studies that are extra biblical and you can come up with pagan traditions using the word Gehenna, but that isn't what the Bible's talking about when it talks about hell. Hell's a real place. And it's a place of torment. Let's look at a couple of things in our in our context this morning, just briefly. I want to look at verse 23, and I want us to see the analogy. Here we have uh, in, here we have a geographic location that is that is a high place, it's a mountaintop kind of geogra geography. In verse 23, thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Jesus said in, in Matthew 11, He said, if you had had the, if Sodom had had the opportunity that you'd had, it would not have been destroyed because Sodom wasn't as hard-hearted as you. Now don't read into that more than is necessary. The fact is that Sodom deserved judgment. But Jesus had said that if as much had been invested in Sodom as is invested in you, then you would have escaped judgment, or Sodom would have escaped judgment, and yet you uh, have not because you wouldn't respond to what I've done for you. And so hell is going to be the place that you are. And you say, well, pastor, hell means down. It means low. It's going to be brought from a high place to a low place. Well, I believe that there is a universal concept in Scripture that supports the reality that heaven is in the center of the earth, or hell is in the center of the earth. I believe that if you study the Bible carefully, that paradise was also in the center of the earth. So I wasn't so far off, guys, laughing at me for saying heaven. Paradise was also in the center of the earth until the completed work of the cross. And we'll actually see that here in a minute when we look at in, in Luke 16 where hell is a place of torment. But the reality of it is that hell is down in every reference. And so knowing that God is a God of all men of the whole earth, the only direction that's down from everywhere in the world is where? The center of the earth. And so it makes a lot of sense. Matter of fact, it explains a lot, doesn't it? You ever wonder why it's so hot the deeper you go in the earth? You just ever wonder how did the earth get so hot? People say, well, you know, the earth used to be burning and it's cooling. You know, well, that's an evolutionary theory, but it doesn't make much sense. Because actually there couldn't be life, there would be no way to sustain life on a planet where things were burning and are then cooling off. We would, that, that would not be a place, that would be a place that would be hostile to human life. No, God created the earth. And God put hell in the middle of the earth. And the deeper a person goes, the more that, the, the hotter it gets. Where does the pressure, where does the heat come from the volcanoes? I mean, literally, there are live volcanoes where you can look at, uh, you know, a crater in a volcano, and we're talking like 9,000 degree temperatures in the parts that we can measure, but knowing that it gets much hotter uh, down below. Where does this temperature come from? Well, I believe it's hell. I believe it's hell. I don't think it takes a genius to understand that when the Bible says that hell is down, and when we look at the earth and we recognize it's hotter. By the way, uh, science and the Bible are always in agreement. Now, sometimes there's pseudoscience, there's fake scientists, that as scientists believe things that contradict the Scripture, and later on they find out, okay, we were wrong about what we believed. It's funny because today, quote, scientists try to accuse people that believe in God and creation of being flat earth uh, people and so forth. No, the, the flat earth people used to be scientists. The Bible's always taught around earth, the circle of the earth, or the sphere of the earth. has always been taught. God knew what the earth was when He set it in the heavens and set it into balance and set it into orbit. If you read the Bible, the scientists used to mock the notion of a round earth. Uh, uh, and, and yet today, you know, they want you to believe, oh, you know, it's always been the, you know, the religion people that believe in flat earth. No, not so at all, my friend. That's been individuals that didn't believe the Bible that embraced the flat earth concept or theory. Um, so, I believe hell is in the center of the earth. Every reference in the scripture that talks about hell talks about going down to hell. We see some, in, some incidents in the Old Testament where the earth opens up and people drop into hell. They drop into the center of the earth. And so hell is a place of judgment and hell is, is down. Let's go back one chapter in Matthew. I just want to look at something. I want to talk about uh, <clears throat> how that there ought to be a, uh, an appropriate fear that we ought to have of judgment or of hell. In verse 28 of Matthew, we saw this a couple of weeks ago, the Bible says, And fear not them which kill the body, 
but are not able to kill the soul. Rather fear him <clears throat> which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So hell is a place where the resurrected dead go. And I mean dead as in not alive in Jesus Christ. Body and soul. Hell is not a psychological realm. It's not a spiritual realm. It's a physical place. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 28, soul and body. Now, you can't see an individual's soul, but you can see an individual's body. Do you understand what we're saying? And the Bible says that God is going to destroy those individuals who reject Him, their soul and body, in hell. Hell is a real physical place, and it's a place of the physical body goes. You say, Pastor, what happens when a person who is... Uh, who is wicked and dies without Jesus Christ, what happens? We, we bury their body in the ground. My friend, there's going to be a day when God resurrects the bodies of the dead. The soul of a person who is absent from the body, the Bible teaches very plainly, goes into hell. And there are those individuals today that have their bodies in hell, but a lot of people have their, their soul is in hell. But God's going to resurrect the body and their body will also be in hell one day. Friend, listen to me. Hell is not a figurative place. Hell is not a spiritual realm. Hell is an actual place of torment. It's a place that is described as a place of fire and it's a place of absolute torture and it is designed and built for the devil and his angels. It's a real place and it's a place that people who are got without God will go. And you know, I think that the reality of that needs to shake us just a little bit. I don't, I don't care very much for people who try to paint sensational pictures or images of people in torment to get you to care about hell. I think for us, hell ought to be something that, of course, we feel the flame and the fire and the fear of. But hell is not a place that a person who is in Jesus Christ has a fear of. Hell is a place that individuals who reject Jesus, deliberately so, are destined for. It's a place that individuals go by choice. And if you know Jesus as your Savior, my friend, you ought to fear hell. It's not for you. The Bible teaches that it was designed for the devil and his angels. But it is a place of fire and judgment that's reserved for individuals who reject God. And you don't do that by accident. It's incredible to me how people deliberately go to hell. How deliberately people go to hell. You say, Pastor, I don't know what you mean. I'll tell you what, come out with us Tuesday night. Come out and knock on doors with us Tuesday night. If anybody in the world ought to want to know about their future, well, I shouldn't say, I don't want to say it this way. Everyone in the world ought to be concerned about their future. Shouldn't they? I mean, it's, it is absolutely mind-boggling to realize that when you would like to just not be mean, not accuse, not, uh, not argue with anybody, but just tell people about eternal life and tell them about how that they can uh, not have hell as their eternal place of torment. It's amazing how fast you get shut off and you can't talk about anything. You just want, hey, can I, can I ask you a question? you have eternal life? Have a nice day. I don't want to talk about that. Poof, shut the door. People don't want to talk about the most important thing in the world. There's nothing more important than your eternal destiny, my friend. It's incredible to me that a person doesn't want to talk about it. And you know what that means? It means that people actually, on purpose, on purpose, make a deliberate choice of hell. How about this? Pseudo-religion. If anyone in the world knows their religion is fake, at the very least, it is the leaders of the fake religions of the world. If anyone in the world knows that their religion is nothing more than religion, it is the people who lead religions, leaders of religions. Let me give you uh, an example. Some of you have watched the Sunday School series we did some years ago, uh, Essentials of Salvation. We went and interviewed... Uh, we went and interviewed a, a um, Muslim imam and asked him about the things that the Bible says that, you, that are musts in order to have eternal life. And we, we just asked questions about a few, and he gave us a pretty honest interview, and it was very apparent that he, he was just lost. Some, someone else that we interviewed was um, a Catholic priest 
of the St. John the Baptist Catholic Church. It's right down off of Commercial Boulevard on Bayview Drive. And we interviewed the priest there. It was really interesting. It wasn't all on video. But it was very interesting in personal conversation that you really realized that the priest who we interviewed actually knew the gospel and had rejected it. He actually brought up fallacies in his religion. He actually just straight up brought things up that I didn't mention, didn't ask about. Talked about worshiping Mary, talked about the saints, talked about confession, things that I didn't really ask about. But he talked about them and he addressed them because I believe he actually knew the truth. He knew they were fake. He knew that no priest can forgive man's sins. No, By priest, I don't mean a legitimate priest, but no man can forgive men's sins, and yet he embraced something that he knew wasn't true. It was amazing in personal conversation, and I've had this conversation so many times that I realized that these individuals who are actually leaders in religion, and the more higher up they are, the more they know that they are blowing smoke. But I mean, the more they know that it's fake. Uh, I've had people ask me questions. Pastor Price, I heard someone ask you if you thought Mother Teresa was in heaven, and you said you think she's in hell. Did you really say that? Yeah, I did. Yes, I did. But Pastor Mother Teresa, she loved people. She was a sweet woman. She, No, my friend, Mother Teresa rejected Jesus as her Savior, and she trusted her works instead. In other words, she said no to the sacrifice of the cross. said, I don't need that because look how good I am. That's, that's incredible to me. It would be one thing if a person received Jesus and because of the work of the cross in their life they were to say, okay, Christ alone for my salvation and everything I do is because of Him. But actually, and I'm not trying to be offensive about this today, read what Mother Teresa says, and she won't confess that Jesus is the only way. And now she's a saint. And now people are praying to her to help them. My friend, you only need Jesus. It's incredible to me how individuals will embrace good works rather than Jesus, my friend. And it's a deliberate choice for hell. You say, Pastor, do you think Mother Teresa had the truth? Well, I know she had a Bible. I know she had a Bible. And the Bible doesn't teach works anywhere. The Bible teaches the exact opposite of that. I'm sure that over time she was challenged. She was talked to about it. My friend, works don't save anybody. And anyone who believes in works deliberately rejects the cross of Jesus Christ. You can go to any kind of religion in the world and you will find individuals deliberately saying no to the cross alone for salvation. And my friend, what that is doing is saying, I'd rather go to hell than do it God's way. Do people do that? Every single day individuals hold to their notions they hold to their traditions they hold to their beliefs in spite of the realities you know it's interesting there's no debate about whether or not Jesus died on the cross do you know that the cross is a historical fact it's interesting there's actually no legitimate debate about the resurrection you can't find the body of Jesus anywhere in the world. The most powerful army on earth couldn't keep Jesus on lockdown when He was raised from the dead. Thousands of witnesses saw the resurrected Jesus and He walked on this earth for more than 40 days. And when Paul wrote the letter to the church at Corinth, he said there are more than 500 eyewitnesses that are still alive at this time. You want to corroborate the resurrection... It's corroborated. It's proven. There are millions in the world who have received the message of the cross and actually have the witness of the Holy Spirit of God living in them. And my friend, if you know Jesus as your Savior, it's just real. It's just real to know God. And all of a sudden, you know for a fact that religion is fake and that Jesus is God. Those are the facts. And yet individuals reject, reject the simplicity of the gospel of Christ alone. My friend, it is Christ alone. 
The Gospel is not Jesus plus anything. Jesus Himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by Me. My friend, you can't get to the Father by talking to Mary who called Jesus my Lord and my God. You can't get to the Father by praying to an individual who knew God because that individual needed a Savior just like you and I do. There's only one sinless person, and that sinless person died for sin, and it was Jesus, God's Son. There's only one person who's ever been qualified to save, and that's Jesus. And my friend, it is His desire to save to the uttermost all them that call upon Him. And that's you. And if you will reject the simplicity of the Gospel for anything else, can I say to you this morning that hell is a deliberate choice. It's a deliberate choice. It's not because you had a hard time understanding. It's because you refused to do it God's way. Listen, who is Jesus speaking to in Capernaum? Who is Jesus speaking to in Chorazin and Bethsaida? He's speaking to the house of Israel. He's speaking to the religious Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the individuals that are all about religion. And He says to them, you are destined for eternal judgment because you've embraced your religion and you've rejected God's Son. In the very same context, if you go back to Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, Jesus said, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but by the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and to whomsoever the Son will reveal Him. What is that verse if not a verse of exclusivity? Jesus says there's only one way to know God is through the Son. There's only one way to know the Son is through God the Father. Is there another way? Is there a way plus something? Is there an alternative? No, my friend. Jesus died for sin and He's the only way to the Father. Okay, I want to look at uh, Isaiah chapter 5 just really briefly. Got a little ahead of myself, uh, but we're, we'll, we'll just get back, go back behind again. Uh, Isaiah chapter 5, there are, again, we could... As I mentioned, we could look at, if we're going to talk about hell and uh, do, a, do an encompassing study, we could look literally at uh, 54 ver references in the Bible to hell. And I recommend that you do. It would be easy for you to, to get a strong concordance or uh, just do a, do a word search in your Bible and study hell. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 14, verse 13 will begin, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Verse 14, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it and the mean man shall be brought down, the mighty man shall be humbled and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Now we, we could spend more time on this passage of Scripture but I want to go back to verse 14 and and to just notice a couple of things. The Bible says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself. I do believe that what was once paradise is now hell uh, covering over that gap that could not be passed over. Matter of fact, go to Luke chapter 16 and we'll look at that description very, very briefly. I've had people say, Well, Pastor, hell is a place of figurative torment. Matter of fact, uh, if you knew what I've been through, you'd realize that I'm in hell. I don't know um, how many people have told me that I was an adult before I ever heard anyone claim that their life was hell. I, I was an adult before I ever heard that. And I don't know if it's just a trend uh, toward, uh, just a trend in, in our society for people to be uh, less tolerant of life or uh, just to be softer than they used to be. But literally people think, people have said to me, Pastor, my life is hell. There is no more hell than this life that I'm living. And they're very mistaken. Let's look at a man who lived what he thought was paradise in life and was in hell. Verse 19, the Bible says in Luke 16, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So there's a contrast 
between a man who uh, lived a very, very comfortable life, the Bible calls it sumptuous, which means that he just had everything. He just had all the riches, and he lived very, very happily, very, very comfortably. And if you had spoken to him about hell, if you had spoken to him about eternity, he would have said, I don't believe in it. I'm just fine. I don't need to worry about that. Life is good, and don't talk to me. Don't be bringing me any negativity. Then there was another guy uh, who the Bible says was begging at the, at the table of the rich man named Lazarus. The Bible says his body was covered in sores. Most likely Lazarus was a man who had physical infirmities that probably inflicted him so much or afflicted him so much that he was unable to work and unable to carry out and perform a normal life and he was literally miserable. And probably he lived a life that the same people today that think they're in hell would say was hell. Literally, Lazarus was tormented in this life. And the Bible says that both of them died. If you'll look down uh, to verse 22, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Okay, so there's two locations that are visible one from the other in this context. Do you see it? One is Abraham's bosom or paradise, as we described in other places, and the other one is in, in hell, and uh, you can see one from the other. Well, I believe both were in the center of the earth at the time. Now, not today, because today the Bible says to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord. In that day, to be absent from the body was to be present with Abraham. <laughs> You ever think about that in context? Oh, we're going to go to Abraham. Go hang out with Abraham. Well, I'd rather be with Abraham than in hell. It wasn't purgatory. It wasn't a temporary place, but it was a place where individuals were waiting until the completed work of the cross so that they could have the separation between them and God, which was their sin, finally dealt with and to be able to leave paradise and go to be with God. This is not a sermon today on heaven. I like to preach on heaven sometimes because I like the way that, uh, that Samuel Clements puts it in, in or he's, uh, Mark Twain when he's writing about Huckleberry Finn. And he talks about heaven. He said he talked about two versions of heaven. He said there was the Widow Douglas's version of heaven and then there was Miss Watson who lived with Widow Douglas. He said, he said uh, Widow Douglas, when she described heaven, she, he said he'd make a body uh, begin to salivate. You know, you'd, you'd want to go there so bad. And he said, well, Miss Watson talked about heaven. You decide you might want to go to the other place. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, is I could totally relate to that mindset. But I look at pictures people paint of heaven, and I'm like, yeah, that'd be boring. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. You ever seen the, I haven't seen these in a while, but the heavenly pictures, you know, where they got little, little uh, babies with wings on them playing on a harp flying in clouds. I'm sorry, I'll pass on that one. First of all, I don't like their clothes. Secondly, I don't want to play a harp. And thirdly, I don't want to float in the clouds. That just doesn't seem like heaven to me. Well, paradise was a real physical place. It was actually in the center of the earth. And I think probably if we were going to describe it, it probably would have been like the Garden of Eden would have been, I think, before the curse with some differences. However, uh, hell and paradise, regardless of what they are, they were visible one from the other. They are both at the same or in a similar geographic location. But we'll see in the next verses that they were separated. First of all, I want to look at torment. Verse 23, the Bible says about the rich man, In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And so we see that, that there's a flame in hell. There's a fire in hell. And we see in Revelation later on that hell is cast into the lake of fire. And so a greater place of fire and torment. But hell is a place of torment. Hell is a place of fire. And from hell at the time, it actually, you could see in paradise, he could see Lazarus. And I don't know how much worse it would increase the torment, but he could actually probably see water. And see Lazarus with water and said, you know, have Lazarus bring some of that water. Just have mercy on me and have Lazarus bring me water. And I can see why he'd ask for Lazarus to do it. I think the rich man probably fed Lazarus. Poor pathetic beggar that he was. 
You poor beggar. You know, I think part of the reason you're so poor is you believe in God. What's God doing for you, Lazarus? Here, let me do something for you to show you, show you what a real God is. And now, he's fed Lazarus. He's done things for Lazarus, I believe. And now Lazarus is in paradise and he sees Lazarus and he's like, oh, what? What's the beggar doing in paradise and I'm in hell? Would you send the, Would you send Lazarus and have him dip the... Just, 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 just to dip his finger. Just drip water on me to ease the torment. The Bible says in verse 25, Abraham said, "Son, remember that thou in thy life receivest the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted, and thou art tormented." My friend, heaven's a place of comfort. Paradise was a place of comfort. But can I say to you today? that hell is a place of torment. And can I say as well, according to verse 26, that hell is a permanent place. He said, Beside all this between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. We can't go to hell, and you can't go to heaven. By the way, sometimes study those two statements. You can't lose eternal life, my friend. He said, I can't. If I wanted to, I couldn't go to hell. Abraham said, there's a great gulf. He said, I can't cross that gulf. And he said, you can't come to heaven. And so we see that hell is a place that solidifies forever, makes permanent a decision of unbelief. How does a person get to hell? You know, it's really interesting the way Jesus put it when he was talking to Nicodemus. He was talking about condemnation. He said uh, that he did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus said, I didn't come for the sake of condemnation. But he said this, He that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not, can you say it with me? Is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed. My friend, in order to pass from condemnation unto life or unto uncondemnation, you must be born again. And it's a decision. And it's a decision that every individual in this room today is fully capable of making. But someday it's a decision that you will not any longer have the opportunity to make. I don't know how many people that I have said to me, I'll see you, and I haven't seen them again. See you, and I haven't seen them again. And I don't know how many times my heart has been glad to know that I know that person made a decision. Joel and I knew a man some years ago. Came by my office on a, I think just on a weekday, and he said, "I just, I, I got to talk to somebody." And he came. I was when we were on Federal Highway. He came up to my office, and he said, "I need to know for sure that I'm going to heaven." And we dealt with him, and you know what? He grew for a while spiritually, and then some things happened. He kind of wronged Joel. Actually, did something, and uh, he got away, and uh, uh, got away from the church, got away from fellowship. And uh, then randomly I was reading a news article and I saw that he'd been murdered. Thrown down a stair a tower on Oakland Park Boulevard a couple of years ago. And I thought, man, I'm glad that I know where that man is. Because he made a decision. Yeah, listen, you know, it's made some wrong decisions after he was saved. But I'll tell you something, I'm confident he has eternal life. And it's forever settled. He can't cross, he can't undecide that he has eternal life. It's a, it's a once for all kind of a decision. But you know, sometimes I think of individuals that I've, that I've spoken to and I've prayed for and I've, I've pled with them, will you please settle the matter of your eternal salvation? Would you just receive Jesus? How complicated is it to receive Jesus? Well, my friend, it's the most difficult thing. It's the simplest thing all at the same time. Because you must bow. You must set aside. Whatever it is that you're trusting instead of Jesus, you've got to give it up. You say, well, I've always been, I've always been a good person. You've got to give that up. I've always been... You know, when I've been a Christian my whole life, I was baptized as a baby and my family's all Christian. My mom was saved. My grandma was a Christian. You've got to give that up. I'm telling you, people go to hell because of what they won't give up. They won't give up their experiences. They won't give up their notions. They won't give up their relationships. I've had people say, well, you know something? You know what? I know for a fact my dad, he hated Jesus. And uh, he died hating Jesus. And if, and if my dad isn't in heaven, I don't want to go to heaven. My friend, you've got to give up the notion that there's any profit in following someone in rebellion. 
the notion that there's any good at all in following an individual who rails against God, who hates God, and saying, you know what, I'd rather, I, don't, I don't want to be separated from that person. My friend, hell is not a place of fellowship. Hell is not a place where you're going to get together. No, hell's a place of torment. And trust me, believe me, you don't want to be in torment with anyone else in torment. And no one in torment wants you there. Now let's see that. We'll look at that and we'll be finished up with this passage of Scripture. In verse 27, the rich man said, I pray you therefore, thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. See, hell's a place that if you were there, you wouldn't want anyone else to be there. I've said this to people before. People have said, well, you know what, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that, you know, because my mom or my dad or my brother or my sister, I know they rejected Jesus, and if they're in hell, I'm afraid of being separated from them. My friend, if your relative's in hell, they wouldn't want you to come there. Hell's a place where every decision is made permanent. It's made eternal. But it's not a place where anyone there would say, hey, good decision. Come on. I'm not being funny. I'm not being silly about that. I'm telling you the truth. You know, I've preached funerals before of people that I, as far as I know, they were in hell. And it's kind of tough to do. But based on Luke chapter 16, I've said to people before, I've said, you know something, I want to tell you someday, your loved one isn't here. But if they were here, I want to give you a message. I want to tell you something I know they'd want you to hear. And I, for the, for the sake of kindness, don't say your loved one's in hell and doesn't want you to be there. But my friend, based on Luke 16, I know their loved one doesn't want them to go to hell. Frank, can I say to you that any person who has rebelled against God doesn't want you to follow them in their rebellion? They don't want you there. Don't go to hell because of who it would separate you from. It's foolish. Foolish. No one has to go to hell. God never designed hell for man. Hell is for the devil and his angels. Hell is a place reserved for those who reject God. But friend, in order to get there, you don't have to do anything at all except for remain in your unbelief. See, believing is a choice, and so is unbelief. Not receiving Jesus as your Savior, my friend, is a decision. Just as sure as if you'd said, God, I'd like to go to hell. And that's a fact. And so let's finish up this morning. What are we supposed to do? Back to Matthew, if you will, please. Matthew chapter 16. Hell's a real place. Hell's a place of fear. Hell's a place that's down. It's in the center of the earth. Hell's a place of torment. Hell's a place where the people there wouldn't recommend. Matthew chapter, chapter 16. Let's see if I can find my place. Look at verse 24. Then Jesus said unto His disciples, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. Verse 25, He said, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for My sake shall find it. It's incredible to Me. Matter of fact, we kind of talked about this with the teens this morning in Sunday school class. It's amazing how we think that we're going to lose something if we gain Jesus. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto it. He said, the, all these things, what are you going to eat? What are you going to be clothed with? What, are you, what, are, what am I going to? What am I going to that people take thought about? He said, those are the things the Gentiles seek after. He said, you seek first God, His kingdom, and His righteousness, and everything that the Gentiles are trying to have, I'll give you. All these things shall be added unto it. We think sometimes that to follow Jesus, we're going to lose something. And yet the Scripture says, whoever loses his life, the Bible says, shall save it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Listen, you say, well, I don't want to, if I trust Jesus as my Savior, Pastor, I know it's a trick. I know that if God's Spirit comes in me, then I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to be one of those holy rulers. I'm going to be a Billy Bible. I'm going to be one of these, you know, guys that just goes around and just hey, is a radical religious nut like you. <laughs> I've had people say that before. Well, I don't want to be a preacher. Why don't I want to whatever? Hey, <laughs> listen, I... I'm not going to deny that if you get a real relationship with God, it's going to, it's going to affect your life. I'll just tell you, it will, it will affect your life. But you want me to tell you something else you won't believe? You'll like it. You'll like it. Uh, you can't relate to a lot of people who are Christians because you'd say, I could never live like that. Well, listen, my friend, you probably would be worse. You'd probably be more extreme about it. 
actually, if you really knew Jesus. And that's just a fact. And I know you can't relate to that. And I know that's no comfort to somebody. But if you changed, you'd be different. You wouldn't mind. Did you hear me? If you changed, you'd be different and you wouldn't mind. In other words, if God changed your heart, you'd have different desires. And when your desires are different, the fulfillment of those desires, which instead of being evil, are good, will bring you joy. And you'll have a kind of peace that you never had with the wrong kind of desires, which could not be fulfilled. God will give you good desires, which can be fulfilled, and you'll have joy. My friend, you'll never lose anything for Jesus that you'll regret. And a lot of people are afraid, you know what, if I, if I follow Jesus, man, I've changed my lifestyle. You know, there are people who couldn't work their jobs if they followed Jesus, isn't it true? Aren't there, aren't there things people do for money that you couldn't do if you followed Jesus? Well, you know, we'd have to look at our entire lives when you follow Jesus. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say any different. But Jesus said in verse 26, What, shall, what is it profited? If, if he, what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He goes on to say, The Son of Man shall come in glory in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man uh, coming in his kingdom. Okay, so what's the what's the answer to our question this morning? Question is this: What's worth hell? What's worth what's hell worth? What what in this life could be worth eternity in hell? Hell's a real place. Hell's a physical place. Hell's a place of separation. Hell's a place you cannot return from. Hell's a place of torment. It's all those things. What's worth hell? What's worth hell? You know, there are people that you say, Pastor, I don't have an answer to the question. Can I tell you there are people that think they do? I'd rather go to hell then. You ever heard that? I'd rather go to hell then. Well, that's what hell's worth to that person, at least in their estimation and their value. You ever notice that different people have different values than other people? You don't believe me? Try a kid. Try a kid. Give a two-year-old a $100 bill and then sell them a piece of candy. You know what I'm talking about? Now, some kids are pretty astute, but most aren't. Would you rather have a Starburst or a $100 bill? Well, I'd rather have a $100 bill. I mean, I would, but what would a kid rather have? Huh? Starburst. <laughs> you want a Snickers or a $100 bill? You know, we think we're pretty intelligent, but you know many of us are about as reasonable in our value system. Or could I say some of us are less reasonable in our value system than a child that doesn't know that $100 is worth more than a Starburst? Because there are people that think something in this life is worth hell. I don't want to change my lifestyle. I'd rather go to hell. Their lifestyle is worth more than hell. I don't want to be separated from my friends. I'd rather go to hell. Their friends are worth more than hell. I don't want to forsake my tradition. I don't want to, I don't want to be persecuted by my family. I'd rather go to hell. Well, their tradition, their family are worth more than hell. And so the question today as we conclude is this, what is your value system? What's your value system? In other words, what is worth more than eternal life to you? What's, what has more value to you than eternal life? And it will certainly be something in this life. Because if you will not trust Jesus as your Savior, there certainly 100% for sure is something that is more valuable to you. Maybe it's your pride. You know, some people just, just to say, you know what, I've always thought this, but I was wrong. For some people to say, I've always thought, but I was wrong. They'll go to hell to hold on to that. I'm not wrong about what I think. Isn't it so? What will you go to hell for? What do you value more than eternal life? You're here today and you're a Christian, you're a believer, you know Jesus as your Savior. My friend, how real is hell to you? How real is hell to you? Do you realize it's a real place? It's not an imaginary place. It's not a figurative place. It's not a spiritual realm. It's a place where the soul and the body go. Do you realize that hell is a place of torment? It's a place of eternal torment? People that were tormented in the rich man's day, my friend, he's still screaming. 
The rich man hasn't ceased to exist. It isn't over. He's still screaming. And tragically enough, his five brothers are probably screaming in the same place. Because Abraham said they have Moses and the prophets. If they will not hear them, neither will they hear you, though one come back from the dead. Now listen to me. You say, well, if Jesus were standing in front of me right now and He told me about hell, I'd believe Him. My friend, you have the eternal Word of God and the Bible says, the witness of itself says, if you won't believe God's Word, you won't believe God. It's the same thing. If you won't believe, you will not believe. And your reason for believing is not based on evidence. It's not based on truth. It's based on what you value more than eternal life. And I don't think there's anything more to be said about that, is there? God, I thank You for what You've taught us here today. And Lord, if there would be an individual in this room who because of pride, who because of tradition, who because of a lifestyle that they are clinging to, have never dealt with the reality that you don't have to do anything to go to hell except for remain in unbelief. And they have not received Jesus as their Savior and been born again. God, I ask that, to now, that, that to today, that to right now, Your Holy Spirit would give very, very plain, simple conviction. That You would show them the foolishness of pride of a person. That would cause them to reject a loving Savior. That would cause them to, to receive something so negative, so terrible, versus something so positive as having a God who loves us enough to sacrifice His own Son in our place. Lord, I pray that today might be their day of salvation. Lord, for believers today who it seems that hell has become more figurative or less real, God, I pray that the reality of it would be ever-present in our minds so that we would see that it's a place that we must warn men to flee from. So that we'd see the importance of our accepting the yoke or the burden of the gospel and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we plead with men to, God, escape hell. I just pray that you bless and move in our invitation this morning. Before I finish my prayer, I'd like to ask that every person have respect for others in the room would keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, not look around. One of the things that's very important is be able to have a time of privacy and trust. So I'd like to ask some questions in privacy here today where I wouldn't call you out, I wouldn't embarrass you, but if you would just say to me, Pastor, you know something, God's dealing with my heart. I'm not sure, maybe, but I... I don't have confidence that I have eternal life. This matter of hell today is something that I seriously need to consider. I wish you'd pray for me. Uh, I wish you'd pray for me because this is something that I'm going to do business with God about in the very near future. I don't know that I have eternal life. That's not a certainty for me. Pastor, uh, don't, don't embarrass me. Don't call me out. But uh, hell is something I'm concerned about, and I wish you'd pray for me. Just slip your hand up. Just slip your hand up. Privacy of the room here today. No one looking around. Just slip your hand up and say, you know what? Pray for me. Hell is something I have a concern about. Okay? Second question this morning. Pastor, today I've realized that though I've received Jesus as my Savior, sometimes I don't value the right things. Sometimes I'm more similar to people who would rather have their pride, rather have their tradition, rather have their religion, would rather go to hell than to simply bow before God and let God have His way with my life. And a picture of hell today has helped me to have a more eternal perspective than I've had in the past. God's dealing with my heart. He's working on something with me. And uh, I'm going to do business with Him about it. Would you pray for me that God would be able to give me clarity about a decision that I know I need to make about something in my life? Would you just slip your hand up, Pastor, please pray for me. I'll slip them up right back down. That's it, okay? Right back down, okay? then here's what we're going to do. Instead of having the piano play this morning, I'm just going to have a moment of silence at the end of the invitation. If you need someone to pray with you or to find, have, give you help with answers for clarity, I'm available. I'd be available certainly after the service. But you know, I think probably what most of us need is to commit to God what we have said before witnesses here. Would you just do business with God right before we conclude our service this morning? Would you just pray and say, just tell God uh, what you've asked me to pray for you for, and I'll be praying for you as well.
Father, thank You so much for Your Word and the truth in it. Sometimes, God, we talk about things and we look at them and because of the way the world thinks, we think it's negative to be negative, but actually it isn't. It's good for us to have some doses of reality. And hell's a real place. And God, the way we live actually matters for eternity. I'm so glad that those that are in heaven and paradise cannot pass from one to the other. And yet, God, that we have friends who we're going to be separated with for eternity. We have neighbors. We come across the paths of people every day who hell is their eternal destiny. And God, I pray that you would give us a priority and a compassion to preach the gospel to those individuals. Be with each person that's made a decision here today about priorities in their life, about things uh, that they're going to make a decision on on the basis of the reality of hell. Help them, God, to by your spirit, help them to have clarity in their mind. And Lord, just to, to permanently have victory over areas of that they've given to you. Help us to preach the lost. Thank you for this message. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your attention this morning. <clears throat> if you have any questions or if you ever need anything, know that I'm your, I, I find a privilege as your pastor to be able to spend time and answer those questions or help you with guidance on things. We have a Bible book that has all the answers. I'm always available. Uh, if you'll call me sometime, you'll find that I have time to be able to help you with anything, and my wife also and many others in this church. Hope you'll be able to be back this evening. And uh, Thanks so much for being here this morning. You're dismissed. God bless you. Thank you.